Now, good. Yay. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Greetings. Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome all. Welcome to the GVU Center and the inaugural brown bag for 2015. Uh, I am not Keith Edwards. I am the other Keith. Or Keith 2, or as I've been deemed today, Keith 2.0. Uh, we're looking for a name for me. I'm Keith McGregor. I'm the Associate Director of GVU, and I, I'm new here as well. Uh, Keith Edwards uh, regrets he can't be here today. He apparently has the plague or something terrible, and, uh, and he'll recover soon, and, and he'll be uh, good to go. So, but, uh, but welcome to you all. Welcome to the brown bag. Um, so, so first, let me start off by just... Um, Asking who is new here? Raise your hand if you're new. Holy cow, wow, terrific. Well, welcome to you all. Welcome to GVU and welcome to the Brown Bags. Um, I'm going to give uh, a whirlwind uh, sort of tour of the Brown Bag and the events and GVU, and then I'm going to turn it over to some of my colleagues to talk about some uh, research that's going on here. And, um, and after that, the King of Pops will be here for our ice cream social. So stick around for the ice cream social. All right, well, first of all, um, well, what's the deal with this place? What's the deal with this, uh, this brown bag? Um, well, actually, this is one of the oldest um, continually running lecture series on the campus. Um, and this, this has turned out to be a pretty great way for all of us to come together, to get to know one another, and to uh, maybe find uh, people to work with. Um, We've got a lot of events that are scheduled for our brown bag coming up this, uh, this semester. And let me give you sort of a, a glimpse or a preview at that. Um, check it out. Uh, we actually have uh, several, on, uh, several on board here, some other folks being um, connected. Uh, Michael Gorley, who you may know, uh, is uh, instrumental in the development of the HoloLens for Microsoft. He'll be here on October 22nd. That one might be, uh, we might have quite a few people in this room for that one, huh? So come around. This is a very cool and exciting uh, group, and um, we look forward to seeing you here. Now, these slides are from Keith, Keith 1.0, shall I say. And so he gave me this other slide, and I looked at it, and I went, okay, let's, let's talk about etiquette for brown bags. And I thought, oh, okay, etiquette for brown bags. So I'm going to put this slide up just for your uh, consideration. Um, Wow, don't grab the food and run. All right, thumbs up. Uh, now, with respect to the popsicles or whatever at the end, uh, you're on your own, how about that? Um, uh, don't take a ton of food before other people have a chance to have the food. Uh, well, if it's a brown bag, that makes it pretty easy. And um, what else? Oh, if you've got, those, if you've got your, your phone or your device that, that can possibly make a, a noise, make it not make a noise. How about that? All right. And that's what I want to say about etiquette. And I think that's what he wanted to say about etiquette. So moving right along. What's GVU? What's GVU? Well, GVU. GVU is a university-wide incubator, uh, excuse me, interdisciplinary research unit. Um, it's been around for quite a long time. It focuses on technology that's at the intersection of people and computing. And I assume that's why you're all here as well. Um, we also interface with uh, folks in industry. Um, the names you know, uh, Samsung's and, and, the, and the large ones, as well as some that you may not know, uh, Steelcase and others. Um, and we have a large number of labs that are connected or associated with GVU. 
and, uh, and we make investments uh, in those labs to help you all be successful in your research. We've been around for quite a long time, almost 25 years, and originally GVU was graphics, visualization, and usability, but now it's just sort of uh, all things interactivity and uh, people and computing. And that's what GVU is. And it's pretty large. In fact, it's incredibly large. Um, George Tech has been leading in a number of different interactive uh, categories over the years. Um, wearable computing, gaming, social media. Um, uh, Keith, uh, Keith 1.0 likes to describe uh, GVU as being um, sort of the full stack of interactive technology. And, um, and so, of course, we have very extensive expertise in uh, human-centered computing and um, user experience. And it's generally considered to be one of the top places in the world for such things. And, but it's, it's coupled with computer science and grounded in social sciences. Um, and um, we have a dedicated master's program. I see my, my buddy Dick back there uh, in the human computer interface or interaction. And, um, and, and it, we just really stretch the boundaries, if you will, of, of the interaction between computing and, uh, and humans. There are, it's a large enterprise. There are about a hundred research faculty associated with GVU and about 400 or more of the very best graduate students in the nation here in the center. So it's very, very large. The staff of GVU, uh, Keith Edwards, that's him. Uh, I'm Keith McGregor. Uh, Vivian Chandler, is she, she may not be here. Uh, if, you, if you're on staff, stand up and, uh, and just say hello and wave. Sean, I see you. All right, there's Sean. Uh, Laurie is over there. Um, Alicia was outside, I thought. And, uh, and Scott, I don't see Scott. But anyway, these are the staff of GVU. And we have some uh, great TAs. If you're uh, an assistant, if you're, if you're one of these people in this room, please uh, wave. All right, hooray. Now, what do we do and how can you jump in? Well, first things first, let's communicate. Get on our mailing list. Get on our mailing list, get connected. There's not a lot, there's not a lot of traffic here. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunities for you to get involved with GVU that show up on the mailing list. We won't bombard you. So just sign up for the mailing list. Um, take a look there. Uh, and I guess we'll make these slides available uh, later so you can find us. Or you can hit the website and find us there. The other thing that we do is we do a ton of events. So for example, here's a, here's a sampling of the sorts of events that GVU puts on every spring and, and fall. And you can see we've got the ice cream social. It's about to happen. There's the uh, HCI welcome party today. Is that here? Yeah. All right, uh, just outside. Okay, great.
students. And that's really um, men and women, uh, first year, second years, we, we will consider PhD students as well as, as undergrads, but it's really targeted towards individuals that may um, pursue a career in the areas uh, that align with GVU. So it doesn't have to be media, media companies. But WICT is the, the largest and oldest organization serving women in the media industry. We have about 1,100 members here in the Southeast, and they include um, members, executive members from companies like the Weather Channel, Turner Broadcasting, HBO, uh, Scripps Interactive, uh, as well as Comcast, Time Warner Cable, and the rest. Uh, we've chosen some executives who want to meet with students in a circle format. That means you have a cohort of anywhere between eight and 12 students that meet bi-weekly, or I don't know if it's bi-weekly, every two weeks, um, with two mentors who um, will meet here in, in the TSRB building. We have, um, uh, our applications are online. You can go to the, the bit.ly link WICT Mentoring, or if you're interested, you can pick up a flyer here. It talks a little bit more about the program. Applications are due September 4th, and tomorrow at noon in this same room, we're going to have sort of a lunch and learn that talks a little bit more about WICT in general. There's no cost to you. In fact, you get a membership, which means you get to, into all of our events for free. Um, but it's really for you. It's to help you understand. Not You're already great on the science and engineering side. We want to make sure that you're prepared for the business side. So whether you're going to academia or business, how do you negotiate a salary, uh, how do you brand yourself, things that are a little softer skills that you may not learn in your classes here, we want to help you with that. So if you're interested, either come tomorrow or just jump online and, and apply today, and we hope you take, um, take advantage of it. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, Sean, I might need you to help me on this one. How many of you are makers? Come on. How many of you are makers? There's got to be more. Do you know that we have a number of great makerspaces on campus, but one of them is actually just below us. Uh, GVU has a prototyping lab down below here. A number of great uh, bits of equipment there. And, um, and the, uh, you know, Sean, any, anything you want to say about this? Check one, two. Right, very good. So uh, right below us, actually a little bit down over the, in the corner, um, we have the GVU prototyping lab. Um, it's kind of split up into two parts. We've got one which is more of a shop side where we have various um, table saws, drill mills, things like that. Uh, we do have one of the largest CNC routers on campus, which lets us cut out all kinds of interesting things. Um, on the other side, we have a couple of electronics labs. We now have two 3D printers. Um, one of them is the older ABS style, um, which is pretty much what a MakerBot is. This is just an older production version that doesn't break down nearly as often. Um, we also recently just got a 3D Systems 3500 uh, HD 3D printer, uh, which actually uses a liquid UV cur curable material and makes some of the most beautiful parts you've ever seen. Um, as well as circuit mill, we have a very large laser engraver, pretty much all the toys you could ever want to make just about anything. Um, to get access to it, you need to come to one of our orientation sessions. Off of the GVU website is a link to our calendar, and we post those sessions there as well as to sign up. Um, but once you've gotten access to the lab, it's open 24-7. Um, we've also staffed a lot of students to be available to help with different pieces of equipment, um, or if you need help with uh, laser engraving or we have students who are doing special uh, antennas and things like that on our circuit mill. Um, but there are students and staff available to help you out. Um, we That's most of it. Thanks about it. That's it. All right, thank you. Thanks, Sean. All right. Um, as I said, there are a number of different labs here uh, for your use. One of them, uh, and I don't know if anyone is here that can speak to this. If you are, just sort of raise your hand and, and step up and help me out on this. Um, is the usability and video prototype, uh, video production lab. Is anybody here associated with that lab? Nope, okay, rock. <laughs> Sean, you're back up. <laughs> okay, so um, also manage the usability and uh, video production lab. It's more of a usability lab. Uh, it's up on the second floor just off of the main GVU suite. Um, it's set up mainly to do observations and usability studies. Uh, they're 
there's currently one workstation in there if you're doing any sort of software-based uh, usability study. Uh, a lot of students now, most of these software is available for demo, so a lot of your classes, you may end up using some of those, um, but we do have them set up as well. More A is probably the more common one. Um, but there is a observation area as well as a control room, so if you're wanting to do something that's hardware-based or mobile device or anything like that where you just need to be able to um, do observe it set up. Um, I probably am the point of contact for managing the calendar, so if you need to use it, just let me know. Cover it. Yep. All right. Thank you again. Hang on to the microphone. Just hold on a second. And then there's the app lab. If <laughs> and Sean is going to talk about the app lab. How about that? Thank you, Sean. Okay. So on the third floor, room 333, it's kind of right in the core of the building, is the app lab. Um, RNOC, uh, which does a lot of work with CIC, um, which you'll probably hear about a little bit later, Matt and Russ, they weren't here, right, um, are heavily involved with that. Uh, so the, the App Lab is really a, a space where you can go and hack on mobile applications or any sorts of um, devices based on that. So tablets, um, in-car entertainment systems are starting to, to show up in there as well. We've got pretty much any kind of modern phone or tablet that's currently out. If you wanted to test a mobile app that you were uh, tinkering with on a new piece of hardware, you can walk in there and chances are we have one. Um, you can check them out for short periods of time, but it's, uh, we, we try and keep a stock so anyone can do them. Um, it's also just a good space if you're looking for a, a place to come study or hack on something software based it's a great place for that um, there's a lot of interesting people up there who are doing similar things so it's just kind of a big collaborative space so a good place to find people to work with mm -hmm. good lots of big comfy uh, bean bags there's a home theater in there yeah. ping pong table we have ping pong <laughs> so <laughs> all right thank you um, we also offer uh, we have a limited budget uh, to offer to you for travel if you want to go to uh, conferences, you know, here in the U.S. or, or uh, abroad. Um, and, and here's some of the details of this. You've got to be actively working with a professor that's associated with the uh, GVU. And, and you've got to be participating in the GVU activities, you know, showing up for the showcase, uh, things like that. Um, you can get this uh, once per uh, student, one time per year for a student. And... Um, and I don't know about the rest of the limitations because I'm also new to GVU, but uh, they're here on the screen. Uh, check with one of us. In fact, hit that hit the travel fact on our website uh, for more details. Did you get your picture? Okay, there you go. So 300 bucks or 500 bucks, depending on uh, where it's hidden. We also give out a number of awards each year, and. Um, and the sort of the, the big one is the, the Foley Scholars Award. Uh, these, are, these are fellowships that are open to any PhD student that's affiliated with GVU. Um, it's our highest award. And, um, and I'll be talking about uh, this year's um, finalists in just a moment. But new for us this year is also this Distinguished uh, master Student Award. And this is open uh, to any master student that's working with a GVU-affiliated uh, faculty member or researcher. And, um, and these are annual awards. And so let me just uh, share with you a little bit about this year's winner. And if, uh, and if uh, Monette is in the room, then uh, let's, let's have her say some things. Uh, this year's winner of the Distinguished Master's student is uh, Monette Spells. Uh, she's an uh, MSHCI student working for Betsy DeSalvo. Her project involves the MOVE Lab, a collaborative workshop bringing together choreographers, dancers, engineers, and computer scientists to work with 20 high school, stu uh, high school girls to create an interactive technology-enhanced dance performance. The effort introduces girls to microcontrollers and sensors as well as dance concepts. And she was also recently an intern at uh, Intel's Mobility Client um, Platform Group. So congratulations to Monette. How about that? <laughs> Jim, have the finalists been made public? Have the finalists been made public? All right. Well, the finalists for the Foley Scholar are, are these fine folks. 
Um, and the winner is going to be selected later on this fall. But here are the eight finalists uh, from the submitted applications. These are just extraordinary talents uh, here. And are any of you here in the room? <laughs> well, stand up then and say hello. <laughs> hooray. Hooray, hooray. You know what? I think. Uh, so, all right. So, um, so I think uh, uh, Keith re has reminded me that I believe this is the first year where it's all female finalist. How about that, too? That's great. Yeah. Hooray for that. All right, so I mentioned we're going to be announcing the, the winner a little bit later on in the fall, and, uh, and uh, Monette and uh, all the, uh, the winners and the finalists will be at our awards uh, ceremony on October 21st. And so, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Good luck. Good luck. All right. Um, finally, finally for me anyway, um, how do you stay connected? Uh, I mentioned the mailing list. Um, get on board, uh, you know, get to our website, check us out there, follow the links, send us emails, engage with us. We're reasonably friendly folk and uh, we're pretty easy to find. On social media, follow the GBU Center on Twitter and, uh, and check us out on Facebook. And I think uh, that's what I want to say about, about that before I turn to sort of the next phase of what I want to talk about today. All right. You know, we do a few things for faculty as well. Maybe a couple. And I want to talk about those now um, because each year we sponsor, in collaboration with IPAT, a number of research and engagement grants. And, the, and these research and engagement grants, the research grants are there to provide uh, just sort of a seed funding opportunity for interdisciplinary research, but the objective is to bring together as many uh, different disciplines at Georgia Tech as possible into those grants. And in particular, what we're doing is we're trying to find bold work, bold, inspiring work that by its particular nature would be difficult to find conventional funding for. And so um, we're going to give preference to the, when we give these grants out, we give preference to research that will lead to further funding um, from outside sources, and of course I mentioned the strong interdisciplinary uh, notion that's sort of at the bedrock of GVU. On the engagement grant side, these are designed to foster all sorts of new um, collaborations, um, either, either here at Georgia Tech or externally to Georgia Tech. And examples of these sorts of grants could be um, support for an, art, an artist in residence program, uh, support for a new type of community engagement like um, installation spaces or pop-up displays, um, support for new faculty seminars uh, on different topics, and then of course uh, supporting undergraduate hack fest and, um, and supporting for travel for performers to the, uh, that we have here to new venues. And so those are the sorts of grants and engagements that we have. What I want to do today is let you listen to I believe four of the grants that we've granted for this year. Am I right about four? All right? Keep me honest. Thank you. And the first of these, uh, I will ask, um, let's see, this is the first grant, and it is Applying Design Studio Pedagogy to STEM Learning with Novel Presentation and Sensing Technologies, Betsy DeSalvo, Mark Gusdale, and Blair McIntyre. And um, I don't know who will speak. Oh, Blair's going to speak. All right. So Blair, come on up. I know, this is a slide you sent. Wow, thank you. All right, you're welcome. <laughs> Hold on, we can go back to the one there. Yeah, Drive yeah, there. Up. All right. Okay. Um, so this is work that... Uh, uh, oh, here. Microphone? Yeah. I have a big microphone. Microphone. Where is it? Oh, just this? Yeah, use that. This? this. Button. It's an interaction <laughs> thing. Hello. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so quickly, this uh, Betsy, uh, Mark, and I, uh, along with um, tentatively uh, three students listed here, Amber, Allen, and Ryan, are interested in at least exploring this year to find out uh, if they want to continue working on this. Um, so, uh, this started last year because uh, Betsy, Mark, and I were talking about this fundamental problem of. Uh, those of us, when you look around this room, a lot of people have computers doing a lot of different things. I was programming in the back. Beth has got 
my computer? No. Um, I was programming. Other people are probably doing different stuff. Nobody has any idea what the other people are doing. This is a huge problem for education because everybody, even if you're in a shared space, are kind of stuck in your own little world. We can't sort of learn from each other easily without being very proactive about it. In contrast, say, to art studios and other kinds of design studios where materials are spread around, partially completed stuff is all around, and you can actually be watching people while they're working and both offering them feedback or being inspired by them, ask them how they're doing something to get them to help you. Okay, so it's that kind of environment that we want to try to create, uh, where students uh, in lower level CS classes is where we're going to start. We're thinking of working with CS 13, 15 in the spring when Mark is teaching it. Uh, can start to benefit or, or hopefully see some of the, the benefits that we know exist in studio environments. Uh, learning from each other, collaboration, uh, and so on. And, uh, I'm involved, because I don't actually know anything about learning, um, because uh, uh, I'm interested in, in uh, augmented reality technologies. In particular, Mark uh, was really inspired when he saw this um, uh, uh, demo that was done of a project, or a video that was made from a project that I worked on when I was at Microsoft Research with Andy Wilson and uh, Hervoya Benko on using projectors and connects to be able to augment an entire space. So this is the system calibrating, um, which of course we need to, to do, but uh, once you have that, you can create a model of the space. This is, I think, five or six projectors, five or six connects. And now once you have this, you can start uh, looking around, supporting interaction, and potentially projecting everywhere in the space. When we do that, we can start taking the virtual information, we hope, out of the computer that the students are working on and putting it around them. So if I'm doing a little, creating a little picture in CS 1315 where I'm running a program to generate a, an image, maybe every time I run my program, the images I'm creating start appearing around me on the walls and you could look at me and say, hey, how did you do that? Or did you try doing this? And the kinds of behaviors we see in, in design and art studios. So we can project everywhere. We can put anything everywhere. How can we use this for good as opposed to goofiness, which is what we see in these videos? So we're going to be doing this this year. Uh, the stuff will be set up uh, in the Mixed Reality, Augmented Reality Lab on the second floor, probably somewhere else. If you're interested in this, feel free to stop by and see how we're doing. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Uh, who's up next? Uh, Reimagining the Humanities Visualization, a Research Through Design Workshop for Civic and Cultural Data. Here you go. Thanks. You bet. We're going to do this together. Although, um, um, Lauren Klein, who kind of initiated this idea, unfortunately can't be here today. Um, but this is, this is something we put together with a much larger group. Uh, you can see all these names up here. If, if I could get you know everyone that's mentioned here to kind of stand up, that would be that'd be awesome. I don't know if. You <laughs> so we've been we've we've been working we've been working with a large group of people doing visualization throughout GVU and across Georgia Tech, um, and we've we've had this reading seminar that we started last term, and that's been continuing. And we've been thinking about ways to expand it because what's been really great at doing is bringing together people from different disciplines who are interested in visualization. So this workshop is principally about bringing together people from the humanities and people from um, interact interactive visualization from computer science and related disciplines who want to work together. Um, so uh, the premise for it, the argument behind it is really simple. Um, first to start with the idea that, um, you know, Georgia Tech is really a, a center that's known for both its work in visualization and increasingly uh, in the area of the digital humanities. By and large, um, these two areas uh, are not connected, right? There's, we're beginning to see some overlap and we're beginning to actively work towards that, um, but um, they're not as connected as they could be. And so we saw this as an opportunity, particularly because there's some interesting challenges that happen with regards to um, uh, the humanities. So, um, so data in the humanities research is um, messy and it's fractured, right? It's often incomplete, um, it's often uh, qualitative rather than quantitative uh, in nature, and it presents a unique set of challenges for working with it. It's, 
it's different than other kinds of data that is often treated um, through various forms of information design, whether that's interactive visualization or digital mapping or so on. And so the question really is, how can we use visualization techniques to explore this data? And, and in particular, how can we try to develop new kinds of tools and techniques that keep the messiness in some ways messy, that don't try to take a reductive approach um, and just sort of reduce this to, to something we're familiar with, but really allow us to grapple with this data in the ways that we think makes sense to do that, and to come together and to do that as a truly interdisciplinary type of project. So um, by way of example, so here's an example um, from a project that I've, I've been working on for a little while. This is a, a tag on a tree uh, at a place called the Arnold Arboretum in Boston. I don't know if anybody has been to the Arboretum, but these Arboreta are not only scientific institutions, they're really places of cultural history as well. And, they, and it's really important to, they track um, kind of uh, how, 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 how various kinds of plants have been kind of part of the cultural history of a place like the United States. Um, so for instance, this is a tag on a hemlock tree, and hemlocks, um, um, particularly in the Northeast, are kind of um, going extinct because they're being, um, being attacked by an invasive species called the, the woolly adelgid. Um, and so, and looking at this, this data and thinking about how to present it in new ways that capture some of the kind of cultural context of what's happening to these trees. So this is a visualization that I worked on that tries to bring together on one side what you think of as a conventional um, information visualization, um, a, a timeline, a scatter plot of all the hemlocks that have been collected over the history of the Arboretum, um, together with narratives and images and other more, what we might think of as kind of humanities ways of telling stories, um, to try to give some context for um, what might otherwise seem like just a, a piece of data. Um, or as another example, um, some of Lauren Klein's work is looking at historical records um, in America. And so what you see here is actually a ledger that was kept um, by, um, as part of, um, by Thomas Jefferson. And one of the things that she's looked at in her research is how can we go through these historical ledgers and see the ways in which references are made in them and use this as a kind of data to explore relationships, to explore and produce an understanding of history that we didn't have before, that would have been much more difficult to do without data visualization techniques, but also pose a challenge because of the nature of this data and how difficult it is to get into the system. So for example, in one of her projects, um, Lauren has looked at the ways in which Jefferson referred to other people throughout um, his manuscripts and his notebooks. And one of the things that she's come to realize and publish on um, is that in fact, in Jefferson's correspondence and in his references in the notebooks, he actually speaks much more um, about those people who were his slaves than he does about his own family members or other of his associates. And what we begin to see through these kinds of visualizations is the telling of a different story, in this case about Jefferson's relationship um, to his slaves and to issues of slavery. And that begins to let us understand American history a little bit differently. So taking these as examples, what our plan is is in the spring of 2016 is to host a two-day workshop here at Georgia Tech, which will have 20 to 30 participants from around the country um, that are brought in information designers, visualization researchers, and humanities scholars, and over the course of those two days to prototype a series of low fidelity tools and techniques to help us explore how we might combine information visualization and humanities research to produce new kinds of knowledge. I think that's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, promoting cognitive systems research at Georgia Tech uh, with Ashok Gold. I'm Ashok Goyal, we'll do this jointly. I'll do the first couple of slides and Betty will tell you all the important things that we actually going to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we're going to be talking a lot about cognitive systems. A bunch of my colleagues are joining us in this collaboration. Is, are any of your colleagues here? Keith is there, right? There we go. So, so good to have Keith on this team as well. 
So this is a very strongly interdisciplinary project. So let's talk about what exactly is a cognitive system. So there's an icon on the left. What does that icon stand for? Siri, and the one on the right? Watson. So those are two examples of cognitive system. So cognitive systems have suddenly, over the last five to 10 years, become extremely popular. Uh, and one way of talking what a cognitive system is, is to think in terms of intelligent systems that are human level, human centered, and human like. So both Siri and Watson are human level. You converse with them the way you might converse with a colleague. They're human centered, you actually interact with them. And at least aspects of them are human like. Not all aspects of Watson or Siri are human like, but some of them are. Now these are just two popular examples, but there are a large number of examples of cognitive systems. Just to take another example of a cognitive system that all of you probably have heard about, semantic web is a cognitive system. Because again, it is human level, human centered, and in some aspects, human like. So cognitive systems have become very popular over the last five, 10 years, and the idea is that we want to make Georgia Tech the center of cognitive systems research in the country and in the world. So uh, we're looking at uh, a series of uh, seminars with external speakers, and we're looking for speakers that are of interest across our collaborative group, across uh, the different departments at Georgia Tech. And I'm part of Georgia Tech Research Institute, so uh, sponsors and uh, technologists and collaborators that we could all work with. So we're looking for a, a series of speakers who will encourage that collaboration and uh, with whom we can follow up or who will encourage us to follow up in a directed way and not people that we will go away and um, just internalize what they've had. We have a set of monthly meetings that we've been doing for the last year. Ashok and I have been uh, co-hosting those in the GVU cafe upstairs. And um, we have uh, different speakers, different people who wish to talk about their projects or uh, talk about potential collaborations or any opportunities that are coming up across the cognitive systems community that we are building. We've been having yearly workshops. Uh, we've had two. and are planning a third one next May or June. Um, so we're looking for internal collaborations, uh, enhancing visibility with uh, other collaborators and researchers and sponsors. And our big goal, I'll give to a show. Our big goal is to set up a center. Hey. And the center is going to be the center of the world in cognitive <laughs> system research. So join us. Uh, we are very, very interested in highlighting our students' work. Uh, it has been awesome the way GVU and IPAT and other organizations highlight uh, the work of our students. And this will become another avenue for doing that. So thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you, sir. And I think the last one uh, to describe today is um, the real-time control to replace schedules on Atlanta streetcar. Is, uh, is Kerry Watkins here? Yep. All right. Come on, Kerry. I knew Russ was not here. Yeah. There you are. And I, there's you. your real slide. So um, I am rapidly becoming the one around here who's known for bringing transportation over to GVU and IPAT and getting more and more involved with activities over here. And so we were lucky enough yet again to get a seed grant from about a project in the transportation world. Um, and I'm actually going to turn it over to Simon, who's the PhD student who's funded on this project to tell you more about it. But before we do that, um, it, I'm want to let you know about an event that's coming up on September 26th. It's a Saturday morning uh, into the early afternoon called Transportation Camp. This is something that's been done on Georgia Tech's campus a couple of times before. But if you're interested in the interface between technology and transportation, it's an event you're going to want to check out. Um, we, it's actually an unconference. And so we have sessions that are proposed by attendees that morning. And and then we usually have about four sessions. This year we have a keynote um, of Keith Parker, the general manager of MARTA, who's going to come and sort of lead things off. And then there's a lot of discussion about how do we make our transportation system locally more sustainable, more efficient. 
And so please get in touch with me or check out transportationcamp.org and click on the Transportation Camp South link. Um, there is a $10 fee to attend, but we give you lots of food and a t-shirt. So it's definitely worthwhile. Um, so with that, who in the room has ridden the Atlanta streetcar before? Not too many people. You guys need to get out more. <laughs> well, um, if you have ridden it before, perhaps your experience was that the streetcar was not quite as fast and efficient as it could be, and that's really the goal of this project. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Simon. Thank you. So um, I'm very grateful to be here, and thank you, everybody, to be here as well. Uh, I want to talk about a real-time bus dispatching method for the Atlanta streetcar. It should really be a real-time streetcar dispatching method for the Atlanta streetcar, but that sounded kind of redundant. <laughs> so uh, for all of you who haven't ridden the streetcar yet, it's a, a loop uh, system that's uh, rather small, uh, where streetcars run in mixed traffic, and so because of that, they're subject to traffic conditions and uh, uh, technical failures. And, and, and for that reason, it's very difficult to predict uh, its, its operating speed. Now, predicting its operating speed is very important when you're trying to schedule uh, a, transit, a transit system because you have to know in advance when it will be able to get to control points to be able to dispatch it from, from these control points. So. W what is a schedule? Well, from, from a user's perspective, if you go on the, the streetcar website, it's just um, a statement that says streetcars run approximately every 10 to 15 minutes. Just, you know, go to the station and it'll come soon enough. But for operators, it, it's quite different. From, uh, for operators, you know, a, a schedule is just a piece of paper that says be at 9.29 at this place and then be at 9.42 at this place and, and so on and so forth. And so... These schedules actually require a lot of buffer time to function because uh, drivers need to be able to, to get to those control points before they can be dispatched. Uh, but, for, but for passengers, they, they don't really have any value because passengers don't even have access to these schedules. So now that we have real-time information, passengers know essentially when, when their vehicles are going to come. But the, the, the streetcar, the, the system can also use this information to improve its service. So what we're going to do is, uh, as part of this research, we're going to equip the streetcars with the, the GPS devices. And using the, the location data, we're going to predict the arrival time of streetcars. And then this information is going to be fed into an algorithm that we developed in our lab to dispatch the, the streetcars uh, optimally and, and maximize the, the frequency of service to minimize uh, passenger waiting time. So we're going to put tablets in the, inside the, the cabins to um, communicate instructions to drivers. And so we anticipate that the, the holding method will help increase the frequency and will provide a nationwide uh, case scenario for uh, real-time control. So that's all we have today. And if you have any questions, well, actually, there's no questions. So <laughs> well, actually, there is questions. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. Um, insofar as I'm able to do this and, uh, and being fairly new on the gig, uh, are there any questions uh, about GVU or the things that you've seen um, that you want to just raise here and now? If not, I am always told to never stand between someone and either food or alcohol. <laughs> and so with that, uh, let me just say, welcome. Welcome to one of the most exciting, vibrant, creative places on the planet. It's amazing, and it's amazing because you are all here. And so thank you for being here. Welcome to GVU, welcome to the Brown Bags. And with that, I'll turn it over to the King of Pops. <laughs> Let's go.